Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Housen. In this law session, we'll focus on the answering of our exam questions. In particular, we're looking at English legal system or your syllabus if you're doing, for example, the external uh, program or the international program from the University of London. It will be referred to as common law reasoning and institutions. So if I flip between saying ELS questions or CLRI questions, I mean exactly the same things. So this session, of course, will focus in on answering ELS or CLRI exam questions. Now, this area tends to look at uh, the whole idea of common law reasoning and in institutions or the English legal systems. So the kind of things that we're looking at here are, how do you answer questions in relation to precedent, for example, or statutory interpretation, or in fact, legal aid? Uh, the civil justice system, the criminal justice system. These are the areas we're concerned with. Now, by and large, when you look at answering exam questions, and in, in fact, the point that I will focus on will, of course, assume that you have knowledge of the syllabus in this area. So it also assumes that you have either watched uh, the law session videos in the English legal system series or you've completed your reading or attended your lectures at your university because this entire session is focused on how you approach and answer English legal system law questions. Now, in the first four of uh, the segments, I will, of course, look at a general approach. In the following three segments, uh, what I will do is I will dissect an ELS question and the three years that I've chosen for us to do this on are, of course, uh, the Supreme Court. We we'll look at that. We will look at the doctrine of precedent and we will look at the civil justice. Uh, in particular, looking at the civil justice, we will focus on alternative dispute resolution. Now, when you look at ELS or CLRI, it is predominantly an essay paper. However, there are situations, for example, within the area of statutory interpretation, which, of course, lends itself to a problem scenario. And certainly, if you are following the University of London International Program, they have, year on year for the last uh, four or five years or so, uh, included a problem question relating to statutory interpretation. So what I have to say about this area will, of course, touch on your ability to answer problem questions as well. Now, the questions I will use are real questions which have been taken from the University of London external or international uh, LLB programs in the last five years. Now, personally, I have assisted hundreds of persons with examination preparations, not only for their LLB, but also for the New York Bar, and certainly for law school entrance exam, for example, uh, in Jamaica where persons have to sit an entrance exam in order to be able to qualify to attend uh, law school there. Now, having completed my own LLB, and my postgraduate diploma in law in the UK and sat and uh, successfully completed the New York Bar exam as well as my other professional qualifications in the Caribbean, I am, um, it is safe to say somewhat that I am able to assist with assignment and exam writing and certainly I am fairly familiar with that and that is my intent here to share that with you. So. It doesn't matter how many hours you actually spend studying and revising. What I mean by that is not that it doesn't matter that you don't have to do it, but it will not matter if you don't actually practice the writing. So, for example, if you read a statutory interpretation or you read civil justice system as a topic and you do all of the reading, you read all of the critics, you read all of the academic commentary, it will not be of any value unless you can put that within the context of an answer. So the law examiner doesn't know how many hours you've spent unless you're actually at the university one-on-one -on -one meeting in tutorials and the person who is uh, taking your tutorial is a person who happens to also be uh, one of the exam paper writers. The examiner will not know you and so his only contact with you will be that three hours 
that you've spent on paper talking to him and when he gets it he has to review it so you have to make that count now the two biggest criticisms of law exam candidates generally are number one that they do not answer the exam question and number two that they have or display very poor time management now as it relates to not answering the exam question the examiner says that the law students have not answered the question now, the law students may very well disagree because as far as the law student is concerned, they have just spent three hours in an, in an exam. So, of course, they answered the question. It may not be a full answer. It may not be the exact right answer. It may not be a first class answer, but they saw a question and they put an answer. Well, who is correct? Well, I would suggest that it's both because the law student did answer the exam question he or she just didn't answer the exam question that the examiner asked. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there is the exam question which the examiner asks, and there is the exam question that the examinee answers. And I think that a, a great analogy would be to draw on this book, which was written, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And the title might very well be, uh, law examiners are from Mars and law examinees are from Venus because when you consider the approach that is taken by examinees you will get examinees who are just absolute, absolutely astounded that they have failed simply because they felt very confident going into the exam they recognized the areas of laws that law that were uh, set out in respect of the questions and they genuinely felt good about the paper but you will get them saying you know I genuinely thought I did very well now the problem of course is that when you look at what they've put ver put on paper versus what is asked that is where you see that they, there is a divergence of the path as it relates to what the examiner wants and what the examinee gives now if you were to consider a question that the examiner asks for example such as the legal aid system in England and Wales is neither in decline nor crisis imagine again the legal aid system in England and Wales is neither in decline nor in crisis now the the, the question here and let's assume that the examiner puts this course after this so he says the legal aid system is neither in decline nor in crisis discuss what a law student tends to read is what is everything i can possibly remember on the topic of legal aid and write it down in 45 minutes and then the uh, law examinee answers that question and barely mention if at all anything about that point that says decline or crisis but they write an extraordinary amount about legal aid now that is not to say it is all done on the examinee because frankly I have seen uh, exam questions where you wonder where exactly the examiner lives because uh, frankly he seems to be living in a parallel universe not just any parallel universe but one that is confined to his own head because when you read the question it seems really way out of touch but the reality is if you pause for a moment and reread the question carefully and pause as you read it you will tend to find that it is a fairly manageable question and it is something that you can actually tackle now the idea is that when you're looking at the question don't take it on board as uh, anything more than a legal hypothesis that you have the legal information you now need to overlay it on the specific question asked in the essay so don't try to regurgitate everything you know about the area is this whole system is it in decline is it in crisis you're still going to have to say what what legal aid is but you would still have to draw a distinction on civil legal aid for example you'd have to draw a distinction with criminal legal aid and then of course look at and refer to the words in the question crisis decline or using some types of synonyms relative to that now as it relates to the second criticism of poor time management 
I want you to understand the significance of poor time management. Now, if you have four questions to complete in three hours and you decide to do two at the best of your ability, the fact of the matter is you simply cannot get more than 25% of the entire marks for doing each question. So even if you do the question to the best of your ability and you do get 50%, so you actually pass at 40 uh, for example, the fact is you can't get more than 50% of the total available marks. So if you can, for example, address these two criticisms, your poor time management and answering the question, you will more or less be there. So how do you address these? Well, in respect of poor time management, one of the biggest mistakes that law students make, of course, is to wait until the exam to actually write that cannot be the case. They spend an extraordinary amount of time reading, which is absolutely commendable, but you must spend time tackling the questions and actually writing out an answer. So if, for example, you've read oodles and oodles and oodles of stuff on, for example, uh, legal aid or on the criminal justice system, you've read what Hazel Jen has to say, you've read Michael Zander, you've read all the criticisms, you've read articles that talk about the wolf reforms 10 years on, one year on, what um, the Bar Council have said, what the Law Society have said, and you feel very comfortable. The issue, of course, is look at, say, two or three questions in the past and try and write an answer to one of those. Because the point is that if you're able to do that, fine. Now, in doing that, as it relates to time management, try and write one of those answers under time conditions. Because the idea is, even if you have a three-hour exam for four questions, which gives you 45 minutes each question, that does not translate roughly to 45 minutes writing time. It translates to five minutes to read, five minutes to reread, and rereading is very important because sometimes you might write a word or a principle or put in not or is uh, where it is actually not correct. You needed to have not put in, for example, not. So rereading is important. So you need about 10 minutes for structure and review. So you have roughly 35 minutes to write. So what you need to do is before you go into the exam, you should know what 35 minutes of your writing looks like. Not just how much am I supposed to write? Six sheets, eight sheets, four sides. What does 35 minutes of your writing looks like when you know the topic inside and out? How can you translate that? And if you know that in your practicing, you can write four sheets and get the thing done properly, then it means in an exam, that's what you can do. So how you manage your time must depend on how you've considered the questions before. Now, what about your question answering ability? Well, if it's an essay question, I would suggest you read it at least twice, three times. Read it four times if possible. And what you sh should see is not just, for example, a legal aid question, but look what exactly about legal aid the examiner is asking. So again, we see the examiner making a statement and he talks about it being in decline or in crisis. So what you have to look at is what is he asking about the area and answer it logically. So you start with a path and then you give a definition. So you set out your arguments in favor of the position you're taking or the position you're advancing and the arguments against. Now some uh, essay questions or statements don't actually require you to actually go against it because it might make a statement that is pretty uh, correct but then it has an additional part of it which then may need the discussion. So you may not need uh, to, 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 to argue against the point taken in the first part of a statement made, and we will look at that when we go to the second uh, segment, but you must ensure that you do the discussion. Now, one of the ways to stay focused, keep referring to the words in the question because that will show that you're answering that exam question. Now, read the question carefully, look at the keywords and qu phrases, 
very few essay questions are likely to ask you uh, to just set out in a, a descriptive manner a particular area. So when you look at the legal aid system in England and Wales is neither in decline nor in crisis, you should not write everything about legal aid in a descriptive fashion, but you should look at what are the pros and cons and then take that on board. Now, as it relates to problem questions, as I say, um, they, they're not a huge feature, but they do come on uh, the questions, for example, in statutory interpretation. I write them, issue rule, application, conclusion. The structure of your answer should be that you flag up what the issue is, what the law or the rule is. You should then apply it, do a logical analysis and discussion, and then make a, 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 a discussion in respect of a conclusion or an outcome. And that, of course, will then mean that you answer it in a logical manner. The greatest thing is to be able to, someone to pick up your answer, read it, and know exactly what the examiner, or know pretty closely what was asked of the question. The danger is to just write everything in a problem uh, question answer, and then somebody re reading it knows that you're writing, for example, about legal aid, but don't have a clue as to what the question was about. It could answer any legal aid question. It's so general. Try and not to do, do that. Well, what I'll do is I will tackle three questions. We're going to take a short break. Immediately on our return, I will start with a question on the Supreme Court and see how logically we would answer that immediately after the break.